This is our second PowerPoint on the balance of payments, looking at the significance and problems associated with deficits or surpluses. And this is a higher level only um, section. So the significance of the current account. In essence, it indicates whether a country is paying its way day to day, showing whether it is export, exporting sufficient domestic goods and services to pay for its imports of foreign goods and services. I've once heard it said that uh, really the only um, purpose in exporting is to be able to pay for uh, corresponding imports. So just a thought. Why can all countries not have positive current accounts? The surplus of one country has to be balanced by the deficit of another. We can't have all countries exporting more than importing. It just doesn't make sense. And also, over a long period of time, it would not even make sense to export more than was imported. In a way, you could look at it and say it's like working for someone else. You're producing all of these goods or goods and services for other people to enjoy rather than the people of your own country. And as I mentioned earlier, exports are useful only for the imports for which they can be exchanged. What might be going on if there were several years of a negative current account, meaning that we're importing more than exporting? It certainly could be grounds for concerns if a country was consistently consuming more than it produced. Now, this has been a problem with the states where they have run a current account deficit for quite a while. It could, however, also be used for future growth of output if the imports were capital equipment. An example of this is China in 1997. They were importing um, more than exporting, but what they were importing was capital equipment, which of course would then lead to uh, growth in terms of their production possibility frontier. Their PPF would bow out and they would in uh, subsequent years be able to produce more by having imported all of this capital equipment. If the domestic supply of goods, so here are some testers, if the domestic supply of goods and services exceeds the domestic demand for them, which is the following is most likely to result? So in terms of um, if we are making more than we're consuming, most likely the surplus we're going to be exporting, and it is the current account which is affected, not the capital account. So we would say a current account surplus. Now, the IB doesn't use these terms visible trade and invisible trade anymore, but who knows, it could pop up in either a, um, oh, a data analysis or, or on a question. Visible trade is, a, um, is trade in goods. So visible equals goods. So tangible that you can touch, that you can see. Invisible means services that you can't touch and you can't see. So if you ever do come across those terms, you'll know what they mean. Which of the following is counted as a debit item on the current account of the balance of payments? Okay, so let's focus before we even try to answer these questions, debit. So remember um, what I told you about keeping the term debit and credit straight? If you go and pay with a debit card, money is automatically taken out of your account. So it must be money flowing out. And because it's on the current account, it has to do with either income on investments or uh, has to do with exports and imports. So when would we have money flowing out of our country. So the purchase of domestic shipping by a foreign resident, well that would be money flowing in. Spending overseas by domestic residents when on a holiday, that definitely um, would count. Um, spending overseas is um, akin to an import because money is flowing out to pay for these. Now let's just make sure that the others don't make any, um, aren't, aren't um, applicable. The export of a car, well, money would be flowing in, not out. And the receipt of interest on overseas shares held by domestic residents, that's part of the uh, current account. But again, it's money flowing in, not out because of the term receipt. So the receiving of. Which of the following statements about the balance of payments is true? The current account records trade in goods only. Well, we know that's not true. It's um, trade in goods and services and also investment flows. The capital account records trade in capital equipment. 
no. Uh, capital equipment would be part of current account. The sum of visible and invisible trade must be zero. No, there's no reason why that needs to be true. And the current, the capital and financial accounts, including official financing or the uh, net error and emissions must sum to zero. So this is the answer. The table below shows a simplified balance of payments of country X in millions. The balance of payments on current account is, so we're looking at current account. So what belongs to current account? Export of goods, imports, exports of services, imports, but not net capital transfers. That's part of the uh, capital or financial account. So exports of goods minus imports of goods. So this would be zero and this would be 20 on a surplus. So the answer must be the 20 million. The balance of payments for a country is as follows. And again, we're looking at the current account. You'd look at this and this and this and this. Ah, this is a bit of a trick. Capital, are we talking about capital equipment? Or ca um, I assume we're probably talking about capital as in um, assets. So here we would have negative 10. Here we would have positive 10, so it would net out to zero. Which of the following results in a credit on the invisible section of a country's balance of payment? Okay, so we're looking at credit. So again, imagine you're paying uh, for a restaurant meal with a credit card instantly as soon as you um, have the credit card processed, money flows in to pay for the restaurant meal. So we have a case where money is entering the country. And invisibles means that it can't be goods. Um, so an increase in foreign exchange reserves, that's part of the capital and financial account, so it can't be that, it can't be this. Tourist visits by foreigners, well, that indeed would have money flowing in. And inflows of capital, that would be part of the capital and financial account. If both current capital and financial transactions are measured, the overall balance of payments of a country will. Well, this is a, a bit of a trick question. I would either say A or B. Sometimes balance from the standpoint that we need to have those net error and emissions added in for it to balance. Um, so that's why I would say it could either be A or B. Okay, we have a visible balance and we have the current account here on, in our table. And we've got year one, two, and three. So from the above information about a certain country, it can be deduced that in each of the three years shown, invisible trade balance was, well, let's look at the invisible trade. The invisible and visible has to net out to be the current account. So let's look at the invisible balance. So it must be 200 for negative 300 and the 200 to sum to 100. In this case, it must be 300. In this case, it must be 250. So let's look at the answer. The invisible trade balance was certainly in surplus. It was positive each year, and so in a surplus. The significance of depreciating and appreciating currencies for countries' exports and imports. We've seen that a currency appreciation means that the currency has increased in value relative to other currencies. When a currency increases in value, this means two interrelated things. One, that one unit of it can buy more of other currencies, and that more of the other currencies are needed to buy one unit of the appreciated currency. So what happens to the price of imports? So we have, we're dealing with currency appreciation. So the price of imports goes down. What happens to the price of exports for, for foreigners? We know that our actual sticker price on the exported goods stayed the same, but for foreign countries, they now have to exchange more of their currency for yours. So from their standpoint, the relative price has gone up. 
the impact on exports and imports. So we have imports have gone up in terms of quantity and exports have gone down in terms of quantity. So this may give rise to a worsening trade balance. So a larger trade deficit or a smaller trade surplus. I just want to focus on this, this last um, item for a minute. When we talk about a worsening trade balance, so basically we're looking at exports minus imports. Just because we've had a change in the value of the currency, such as a currency appreciation, it doesn't mean that you've gone from a net exporter to a net importer. It simply means that we know that the exports will go down, the imports will go up. So we would be dealing with either a large trade trade a larger trade deficit, or if we had a surplus to begin with, we might still be in surplus, but it would be a smaller trade surplus. So please don't make the mistake of assuming that we have automatically become um, a net importer. Um, and, and have a trade deficit. That may not be the case at all. When a currency depreciates, it loses its value relative to other currencies, meaning that one unit of it can buy less of other currencies, and similarly, less of other currencies are needed to buy one unit of the depreciated currency. We've gone over this uh, in detail when we're looking at exchange rates. So if a currency depreciates, we know that the price of imports is going to go up, that the price of the relative price of exporters for foreigners is going to go down. The impact on exports and imports, so again, dealing with quantity, we know that imports are going to go down since they're more expensive. The quantity of exports will go up since they are now relatively cheaper. So this may give rise to an improvement in the trade balance. And again, just because we've had an improvement does not mean that we've become a net exporter. What it means is that if we had a trade deficit before, it might be a smaller trade deficit. Or if we had a trade surplus before, it might be a larger trade, sur trade surplus. Or certainly, um, it might even mean that we've gone from having a um, trade deficit to a trade surplus as well. So it could be any of those three situations. So self-correcting mechanism for the current account. In theory, so again, this is textbook theory, a balance of payment surplus or deficit can be self-correcting. So let's look at the scenario where country A is experiencing a current account surplus. So let's keep this in mind. So in other words, it's exporting more than importing. For other countries to pay for these exports, they must purchase countries A currency. And we know that again from the, our unit on exchange rates. So let's go through this self-correcting mechanism. So if they are um, exporting, so the demand, sorry, the demand of the currency is going to increase. The currency is then going to appreciate with an appreciated currency, the demand for export is going to decrease. With, a, with an appreciated currency, the demand for imports increases. And so let's just look at this for a minute. We've got demand for exports decreasing and the demand for imports increasing. So the current account worsened. Country B is experiencing a current account deficit. So it's importing more than exporting. For the country B to pay for these imports, they must sell country B's currency in order to buy necessary foreign currencies to pay for these imports. So let's keep this clearly in our head. They have a current account deficit. Their imports exceed their exports. So if their imports exceed their exports, we're going to have to have them take their currency, go visit the foreign exchange uh, market, leave them with their currency and buy up foreign exchange to buy the imports. So the supply of the currency increases. 
the currency then depreciates with a depreciated currency the demand um, sorry the demand for exports this is a little little hard to, to read okay so so with a depreciated currency the demand for exports increases with a depreciated currency the demand for imports decreases and the current account improved balance of payments problems the balance of payments can often cause problems for policymakers. A large deficit or surplus may need policies developed to correct it, particularly in the medium to long term. To a large extent, the growth of imports and exports will depend on the levels of economic growth domestically and overseas. So how is Canada affected by this? Well, our main trading partner in the past has been the States, and we saw in the previous PowerPoint because they went through such a um, massive recession, they stopped, no, they didn't stop, excuse me, they bought fewer Canadian exports and that um, worsened our balance of payments. And we went from being um, on the current account, running a surplus to running a deficit consistently and, and quite, quite a profound deficit since 2008. So fact, let's look at factors which influence changes in demand for exports and imports. And they are as follows. Domestic economic growth will lead to an increase in the level of imports. So if we have economic growth, we want to have the French wine and German cars and Italian clothes. The rate of growth of imports will depend on the income elasticity of demand for imports. An income elastic demand for imports will mean that imports grow faster than GDP, than our own GDP. This will tend to lead to a balance of payments deficit. Economic growth in the rest of the world will lead to a um, higher level of exports. The rate of growth of exports will depend on the income elasticity of demand for exports. An income elastic demand for exports will mean that exports grow faster than our own GDP, and this will help to prevent a balance of payments deficit because our exports are growing faster than our rate of GDP. Changes in demand for exports and imports in response to price changes will depend upon price elasticities of demand for exports. The more price elastic is demand, the greater will be the responsiveness to any change in price. So if we looked at LDCs compared with MDCs in this regard, um, we know that the price elasticity of demand for a lot of the products that lesser developed countries produce tends to be inelastic. Whereas for MDCs being, um, and sorry, looking at the LDCs, um, dealing a lot with commodity and agricultural goods. Now, if we look at the price elasticity of demand for um, more developed countries, they tend to be more industrialized goods or consumer goods, televisions, flat screen TVs, um, uh, smartphones, so on and so forth. So that tends to be more price elastic. Also, over time, we know that a lot of um, consumer goods have been falling in price. So the MDCs will be able to capture um, higher sales, proportionately higher sales due to lower prices because of their demand being elastic. So if prices are to fall, we know that the um, MDCs are going to tend to benefit more than the LDCs will because there'll be a greater responsiveness of people buying or countries buying more of their goods. So the change in the balance of payments will therefore depend upon the difference between the price elasticity of demand for exports and the price elasticity of demand for imports and the rate of economic growth in Canada and the rest of the world. The price competitive of Canadian exports. This will be determined by Canadian productivity, the rate of inflation in Canada compared to the rest of the world and the exchange rate. 
non-price competitiveness of Canadian exports is dependent on factors like quality, reliability, after sales service, and so on. So it's not always price that's the only determinant. Current account deficit. Current account deficit is generally thought to be undesirable, particularly in the long run. So this is when we're importing more than exporting, even if it is funded by a surplus on the capital account. In a sense, it is advantageous as the deficit means that the country is enjoying a higher standard of living in the short term because they're able to bring in all of these products as imports and, and as consumers enjoy that consumption of these goods. This is thanks to the higher level of consumption through imports. However, the deficit is being funded by inflows of investment and this will mean interest and dividend payments flowing out of the country in the future. This inward investment also leaves the country more exposed to the whims of external investors. The greater the deficit and the longer it lasts, the more of an issue this will be. So in a nutshell, if we are importing more than exporting, we know um, that uh, that deficit is going to be offset by, with a surplus on the capital and financial account. The surplus means that money is flowing into our country and in essence buying up our assets through the form of stocks and bonds for portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, investing in our bank accounts um, or holding on to our currency and putting it into um, the foreign um, currency reserves in the other country. But what happens with any investments is that they are going to expect to get a return down the road. So in terms of, of profits, in terms of dividends, in terms of interest on bank loans, there will be um, money that has to flow out of our country to pay for those returns on the, on the fact that they are buying up our assets. Furthermore, if you have um, a current account, excuse me, a capital and financial account surplus over time, you know that more and more of your country's assets are being purchased by foreign countries. So an example is that um, the states in China, the states has been importing considerably more from China than China buys from the US. China, in essence, then has loaned the US money in terms of buying up US Treasury um, bills. China owns a huge amount of US Treasury bills, so they have um, an awful lot of, of US assets that they're holding on to. And then, of course, the uh, US is going to have to pay um, interest to, um, to China on those Treasury bills. Does a current account deficit matter? Well, circumstances in which it may not be a problem. Not if the deficit is small or isolated, because the deficit may be one, you can finance it by running down reserves. It's going to be counterbalanced by capital flows, so we know money will be coming into your country, but the negative side is that they're buying up your assets. Um, it could be a reflection of rising living standards as people are importing more and more, and perhaps you've had some economic growth that's spurred this on. And or it could be necessary to rebuild future export potential in terms of vital imports of raw materials and components. And I would add to that capital equipment like China did in 1997, which boosted their future production capability. Does a current account deficit matter? Circumstances in which it may be a problem. It's a problem if deficits are large and persistent because it may reflect trading uncompetitiveness or an overvalued exchange rate, and it can contribute to deindustrialization and unemployment. If financed by capital inflows, this could lead to future outflows, and we've talked about this on a previous slide, of funds such as profits, interest and dividends paid to overseas investors and or high interest rates to, get, to attract the capital inflows with defla deflationary implications for demand, output, and unemployment and employment. If financed through running down reserves, well, the country might run out of, of um, foreign currency reserves. And so the country may need to borrow um, as reserves are depleted from, let's say, the IMF. 
So the International Monetary Fund may impose terms that remove government control over domestic macroeconomic policy, and in the long run, the loans must be repaid with interest. And a current account deficit may exert downward pressure on the exchange rate, which may worsen inflationary pressures as import prices increase. Current account surplus. A current account surplus is less of an issue than a deficit, but it does mean that a country may not be enjoying as high a standard of living as it could be. Again, we sort of talked about uh, producing for other countries rather than your own citizens enjoying the use of, of um, what you're producing. It would be possible for the economy to boost demand and economic growth without running into a balance of payments deficit. So a current account surplus could be seen as an indication of underperformance. A current account surplus under a floating exchange rate system is likely to exert upward pressure on the exchange rate with all the problems which that might, may cause. So policies to correct a balance of payments deficit. There are two principal types of policies to correct a balance of payment deficit. You need to know this because this could well come up in an um, IB question. So one of them is known as expenditure switching policies. So what you're trying to do is that you're trying to encourage people to switch their spending from imported goods to domestic goods. So these might include things like tariffs, quotas, a currency depreciation. So you're making it more attractive to buy uh, locally produced goods than foreign made goods. Now there's another one, this is the second one, expenditure reducing policies. Now this tends to be, um, in my opinion, somewhat extreme, but if it's really important to correct a current account deficit, um, then perhaps this uh, country may have to resort to this. So in essence, what they're trying to do is to lower aggregate demand. If they can lower aggregate demand, people will buy fewer imports, but unfortunately, they'll also buy fewer domestically produced goods. So what, um, what are these deflationary monetary and fiscal policies? Well, we could raise taxes we could raise interest rates we could lower government spending if government spending also includes buying imports so lower income right so lower income levels mean lower spending on imports and a consequent improvement on the current account the extent of this improvement will depend on the income elasticity of demand for imports the higher the income elasticity the greater the improvement there will be on the current account. Consequences of a capital account deficit or surplus. A surplus on the capital account means that there's more investment funds flowing into the country than out. So in other words, foreign countries are buying up your own assets and to do that money is flowing in uh, to make these purchases. This may to be to fund a deficit on the current account if the balance of payments. This inward investment may be helpful to the economy and it could help create jobs, especially if new businesses are being created as opposed to buying existing businesses. And it could boost growth. But anyone investing in an economy, we know, is going to expect a return. So this means that a surplus on the capital account or the financial account will lead to outflows of interest and dividends and profits in the future. The inflow of funds may exert an upward pressure on the exchange rate as the demand for the domestic currency will increase. This might adversely affect the current account if the increase in export prices makes exports less competitive. A capital account deficit, on the other hand, will mean a net outflow of investment funds. So here a country is buying up foreign assets. In order to do so, money has to leave your own country to make those purchases. This means the country is building up a portfolio of overseas investments, which will lead to future returns of interest, profit and dividends. You, we could think of it in a way as, um, or I like to think of it as saving for uh, a rainy day. 
This may be beneficial in the medium term. However, short-term speculative outflows of funds may have disastrous effects on an economy in terms of the depreciation of the exchange rate, loss of confidence, impact on investment output and jobs. Several countries in recent years have been badly affected by these speculative outflows of funds. The Marshall Learner Condition. This uh, is a somewhat tricky uh, concept for, for many students. Very important um, that you understand what it is and that you can remember what the equation is. And um, on Blackboard are some extra videos posted by other economists that you may want to take a look at. So the Marshall Learner Condition looks at the overall impact of a depreciation. So we're looking at a depreciation on the current account of the balance of payments. And it's going to be the sum of the effects we identified above on imports and exports. So the condition states that the current account, so here we go, let's put it in blue. The current account will improve after a depreciation if the sum of the price elasticities for imports and exports is greater than one. The further above one the sum of elasticities is, the greater the improvement in the current account. Now that's a lot to take in. We're going to look at it graphically. It's not going to be a mathematical proof. It's just more of an idea to let you know what's happening. But if we have, let's just go over this concept um, before we move on. If you realize that we're dealing with a depreciation, so we've got a depreciation of currency. So depreciation is happening. And if we look at the sum of the PED, of imports plus the PED for exports being greater than one, then we have an improvement in the current account. So if you can commit this to memory, then if you have another scenario and you change one thing, so I'll just run through maybe one or two. It's, a, it's like using logic for this. If we had an appreciation of the currency rather than a depreciation, and yet the sum of the PD of it for imports and exports was greater than one, then we know the current account would worsen. Or let's change something else. We have a depreciation, but the sum of the PD of imports and exports is less than one, Again, we'll know that we'll have um, a deterioration or a worsening in the current account. So once you know what the, the Marshall Learner uh, condition is, you can, you can then manipulate it for other situations to see what would happen to the current account. So why does this happen? Okay, so we have a depreciation. So Price, and let's look at a price elastic demand for imports. If we have a depreciation, what happens to the price of imports? So price of imports goes up. And so we know that um, quantity of imports will go down according to the law of demand. So we're dealing with a price increasing from P1 to let's say P2. At P1, this is our quantity. And so this is the total expenditure on imports. Let's uh, switch to, uh, to red. Now, after a depreciation, we know that the price has gone up. So we've gone up to P2, and our quantity is now Q2. If we look at this box, we can see that total expenditure on imports has gone down. So the current account improves as less is spent in revenue terms after depreciation. So let's look at exports. Again, we have a depreciation. So we'll look at first in blue of what happens before. So depreciation, so the price of exports 
relatively speaking, goes down. And so the quantity of exports goes up. So here we have our P1 is up here, our P2 is here. So at the existing price in red, this is the uh, total <clears throat> export revenue before depreciation. Now hopefully I can switch the, the pen this time to blue. Okay, so now with depreciation, we're dealing with a lower price for exports. We've increased our quantity to Q2. And in blue, we've got export revenue after depreciation. And it's gone up, so once again, the current account has improved. So as I say, this is not a uh, mathematical proof, but to give you an idea of what's happening, that when we have a depreciation, if we look at the sum of elasticities of demand for exports and imports, and if it's greater than one, then our current account will improve for this reason. The more price elastic the demand for exports and uh, imports and exports, well, greater will be the fall in demand for imports, and greater will be the increase in demand for exports, and the greater will be the improvement on the current account. The J curve. Again, this is also a concept that uh, students um, grapple with, but again, there's supplementary videos by other, other economists on Blackboard. So in an essence, let's just look at what's happening with um, when there's a depreciation. So when there's a depreciation, we know that exports should go up and imports should go down. But that's not going to happen right away. So let's say you're in business and um, you import and you export. Uh, so the currency has depreciated. Right away, people want your exports. But since you're a manufacturer, you don't have the goods necessarily made already. So you may get the orders pouring in once the currency is depreciated, but there's going to be a time lag before you get the raw materials in, before you process them, before you pack them and then ship them. So there's going to be a time delay before you're able to fill those exports. With imports, imports, um, the value of imports are going to go down. So you would love as a manufacturer to halt all imports immediately. But you have made a commitment uh, in the past. You have signed um, sales bills, um, which are contractually binding, where you have agreed to accept orders that were placed um, in the past that will be coming in over the next few weeks or the next few months. So you would preferably like to switch to domestic goods, but you are obliged to take on those imports. So what happens again is that there's a time lag before the imports can start to diminish. So what happens in terms of the current account balance, this being negative, this being positive, it's going to look like a J. The J curve looks like this. There's going to be time before we start to get on the positive part of this curve. So, so, the, so it looks like a J. Time because one, time to fill the orders for exports. Two, time to wait for all the imports that you've already ordered to come in and for you to be able to switch to domestic goods. Thank you.